you so much for the video. This is a, a real pleasure. Is it on? Um, is it recording? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is a real pleasure. And uh, I see some familiar faces in the audience, and I see some unfamiliar faces, and that's extra good. And I see a, a, a very diverse audience, which is really encouraging. A uh, little bit about myself. Um, I was uh, born in Israel to Chilean parents, and uh, my, my dad wanted to do his PhD in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So when I was eight, we moved from Israel to Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I had to learn English. That was the second time I had to learn a language, because my parents spoke to me Spanish at home, and my grandparents, so then I had to learn Hebrew in kindergarten. So I was kind of used to moving around. Then we moved to Canada, and I'm a Canadian citizen, and then moved to California. And then finally, about 10 years ago, I came to New York City. I was looking at a few postdoc options after I studied at Caltech. And I was looking at Stanford, and I thought, actually, it's kind of, I mean, no offense to Stanford, but I thought it's kind of boring, and I wanted to go to New York and <laughs> have a couple really exciting years and to get it out of my system and then move on. Uh, but when I came to New York, I fell in love twice. I fell in love with the city. I fell in love with my uh, partner, who's now my husband. And I decided I just wanted to, uh, to stay in New York. And I was so lucky, I sent an email over to Columbia. I was, I was doing a postdoc at NYU. And I, I sent an email to a colleague of mine and said, I think I'm going to apply next year. And this is a Ravi Ramamurthy. And he literally 30 seconds later, my phone rang. And but you got to apply two weeks ago. Send me your resume right away. <laughs> We're doing a search this year, and this is this rush thing. And then it all worked out. And I've been uh, very happy here at Columbia uh, for the past eight years. It's been wonderful. Uh, Columbia has this amazing environment where, on the one hand, we actually have a campus uh, which ties us all together. Uh, we have such a broad education uh, spanning so many areas that really makes it possible for us to interact with people that are so different from ourselves, message and background, but also in their mode of thought. And I think that that creates for some of the best ideas that exist. So that's a little bit about my background. My own undergraduate was in engineering. Um, and when I was doing engineering, I took a program where you don't have to decide what engineering specialty you want until the third year. And around the third year, I, um, I actually, it's interesting that before I went into engineering, I wanted to study political science. So I've always had this kind of very broad range of interests. And then during my PhD, I almost dropped out before doing the COCAN and wanted to drop out and go study psychology. So I've always been pulled in these very, very different directions. Uh, but I remember since, uh, since my dad, this is kind of one of those corny, cheesy stories you write when you apply to grad school and you say, I've always played with a computer since I grew up. And it's actually true that my dad got a, uh, an IBM PC Junior around the time when I was nine for us. And at the time, there weren't a lot of programs that it came with, so you had to kind of write your own thing. And fortunately, it came with a manual for basics. So I taught myself uh, how to program basic. And another friend also got a computer at the same time, and he taught himself. And so there was this natural kind of little rivalry between us of what did you do on the computer? What did you do on the computer? Mm -hmm. And I think he's the one who started having the idea to program video games, which is a lot of what draws students into computer graphics and into computer science these days, too. And, and so I kind of just chasing after him, I started programming some video games too. And I remember once my, my aunt from Israel came and visited, and she would only play Tetris. That's the only thing that she, she didn't like any other game. And we didn't have Tetris. So I sat and I actually programmed up a version of Tetris, but I was so excited about doing it that I forgot to hit save. So she had a great time playing it, but when we turned off the computer, it was all gone, and I have no proof this ever happened. <laughs> so, okay, so with that, let me dive, uh, uh, no, I want to say one more thing, I want to say one more thing. So, when I was an undergrad and doing engineering, um, I applied for some internships, and I, I, I already knew that I kind of was interested in computer graphics, so I applied for a summer internship at this company called Alias Wavefront. Now, Alias Wavefront is known today as the 
a major manufacturer of graphic software for, for movie studios. And uh, I never heard back from them. And so I, I, I went and I took uh, a summer research project with, um, with a professor in computer science, but doesn't do computer graphics. They do parallel computing, large scale parallel computing, scientific computing. And about a month into this summer program uh, with this professor, I got a phone call from Gord Kurtenbach, who was director of, of research and development at Alias Wayfront, saying, hey, we got your resume. We'd like you to come in. And I, I was like, well, this is like two months after I submitted it. I've already started another job. He's like, well, we'd like you to come in anyway. I said, well, I can't do this to this professor. I, I've already started. I'm going to continue this. And he said, well, come in anyway, and let's just chat. I just want to meet you. So I came in. We had this great talk. He gave me this great sales pitch about this product he was starting called Maya that didn't exist at the time. But now every artist uses it. And he said, this is going to be really great. We really want to get forward. <coughs> Problem is, I, I had this uh, stack of resumes, all of, uh, of artists, and we weren't hiring artists. And HR accidentally stapled your resume to the back of one of the artist's resumes. So only when I was going to pass out the, the resumes we didn't need, I saw that there was a technical resume. And so that's really amazing because it just completely changed the course of my, my trajectory. I went to graduate school and got admitted to graduate school on the basis of, of the internships I did that were all in parallel processing and non-graphic stuff. And I went to Caltech. And as it turns out, after a couple of years of Caltech, working with a, with a professor who worked on uh, very large scale integrated circuits, so microchip design, it turns out that it, we didn't, essentially we didn't get along. The way I wanted to work was very different than uh, the way he wanted to work. I'm very um, ants in the pants kind of guy. So I, I come in, I go out, and not around, then I'm around, and he was more of a nine to five sort of person. So it just wasn't wasn't working, and that's when I was going to drop off to psychology, and that's when another professor came along and said, hey, I want to crush a Coke can. Will you work with me on that, like Lavinia mentioned? And so I had this break where I could suddenly get back into graphics, and I had like 12 weeks to prove myself that it isn't. <coughs> so it's kind of interesting that my trajectory kind of started going in one direction. I, Literally, an accidental staple took it in a completely different direction, and then it came back to graphics. So with that little anecdote, um, what is it that I do? Whoa. There's a weird thing on my. <laughs> this remote just made a very funny symbol. OK. So, so what is computer graphics? images on the screen. So it could be an image from a movie. Uh, it could be a work of art that's uh, thousands and thousands of miles away that is too expensive for you to get to see, or, or doesn't exist anymore, or is highly protected. And now you can look at a scan of it at the level of every individual chisel marking from every different angle and study it to your heart's content without other people crowding in front of you. It is the ability to see a building before it's been built and, uh, and determine if you like the building, if you want to pay $3 billion for it. Um, now, all of these aspects of computer graphics are frozen in time. And my interest, dating back all the way to crushing a Coke can, is computing motion. So that's what I want to talk to you about today. And people have been very interested in depicting motion for a long, long time. Here's the earliest animation that I was able to find. I believe it's the earliest known animation. It's from the third millennium BC. And it was on uh, a decoration on a vase. And here it's just been unrolled so you can see it. And it just tells the story of a goat jumping up uh, to, to, to get a leap. It's a very simple story, but it's a complete story. And it's told. Uh, by these little snapshots of motion. And over time, uh, things got more complex. 4,000 years ago, uh, a person was buried, an important person was buried in Egypt. And on the tomb, there is a much more complex story of a wrestling match. We don't know if uh, they died in this wrestling match or if they were just a fan of wrestling. 
but we, we have the complete history of this, of this motion. And then something came along, the idea of persistence of vision. And this started in, in the um, mid to late 1800s. And it's this idea that if you take these images, these little snapshots, but you display them in front of the eye uh, very quickly, one after the other, then uh, the, you get this illusion that actually it's just one image that's moving in time. And that's the predecessor of the modern cinema. In fact, the Perxinoscope, which I just showed you on the previous slide, a really big version of it was made in Paris um, in 1892, and that was the Théâtre Optique, or the first movie theater ever. And the first billboard ever for a movie was uh, right here for, the, uh, for this movie, uh, Pantomime. Now, maybe what we're more familiar with in terms of classical animation is the story of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Actually, that's the seventh feature-length animated movie that was ever made, but it's one of the ones we know the best. And uh, Disney had a lot of trials and tribulations to make this movie. He announced in the New York Times, we're making this feature-length movie. We're going to employ essentially newspaper cartoonists, all right, not professional illustrators, but newspaper cartoonists, because they can tell stories concisely. We're going to have it done in a year. It's going to cost a quarter of a million dollars. And this was in the New York Times. And three years later, after he was bankrupt and mortgaged his house, and the budget went to five times as much, uh, he finally produced uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And the style in which this was done was by, again, drawing a frame of the animation. And as I said, it cost a lot more than he predicted and took a lot more time. So it's a very labor-intensive process. But what is interesting to me in this process is the exercises that the animators went through in order to make Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and that animators today still go through when they're learning animation. You start with a sack of flour. And what you want to do with the sack of flour is give it lots of poses, <coughs> lots of expressions, lots of gestures, while at the same time, maintaining its sack of floweriness, OK? So that's the trick, is to kind of maintain the inherent physics while telling an artistic story. And so if you think about animating motion, that means that while you're telling the story, you have to support with thoughts about gravity, air, basically anything you can think about that might be in the physical world. So let's take a little look at this snapshot from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And let's look at how the storyline and the humor intermingles with all the underlying physics. So look for weight in the character's belly. Look for swinging motions. Look for the, the bending of the hair or the clothing. Everything that supports the general inertia and motion of the story. So what's beautiful 
here is that there's this amazing story that's being told. It captivates your, your attention. But in order for this story to, in order for you to buy into the story, in order to emphasize the different aspects of the story, there's all this physics that goes underneath, right? The sack of, of whatever being tossed, the weight of the character that they walk, the swinging of the beer, the flowing of the water, and so on and so forth. So they really worked hard on this. And it was all going pretty well um, until computers came along and essentially broke everything. We had to rethink from scratch about animation and the whole process. So now a little history about the birth of animation. Uh, one of the first graphical computers, if not the first, was the Sketchpad. And it was developed at MIT. And it had two separate, one whole room for the computer and another room for the user. And there's a little picture of the user. And they had a little pen that they could move around. And this is the schematic of I, I am Sutherland uh, sketchpad. And basically, the pen had a little light sensor at the end and the cable attached to the computer. And on the screen was a little dot of light that was moving across the screen. And it was timed with the computer. So if the pen was placed on the screen, it could, since it had a little light sensor on it, it could sense the light or not. And so by the timing, as the light moved across, you could figure out where the pen was. And the computer could figure this out and allow you to do all kinds of drawing. And here's a little video of that.
So uh, since, since that time, till today, a lot of the activity that we've been engaged in is adding more and more physics and more and more realism to computer graphics. And we're doing that with several missions and several goals in mind. One of them uh, is to allow us to depict lifelike themes that might be dangerous or expensive or impossible to actually film. <laughs> the camera person who has I'm glad this was done on the computer. This is done by one of Digital in New Zealand. And like with some of the Disney productions and some of the early animations, sometimes we want to use computer animation in the most realistic way possible to say something very compelling along the storyline. Alright? And take a look at this where the physics is really telling a very powerful story. Legend says this land was cold to the ocean like a giant fish. And then it waited. In fact, these islands waited until every other country had been discovered before any human ever set foot here. Welcome to the youngest country on earth. So that's really a powerful message, right? It's completely realistic. You never actually see a continent come out of the ocean, and yet here you're seeing it, and it's giving you this message. This is a really young land. It's really pristine. It's really pure. Actually, when you visit New Zealand and listen to the radio, they have some very, very serious environmental problems, and they have a lot of people calling in locally saying, why are we branding ourselves as this pure and clean country to the rest of the world, and yet we have this atrocious environmentally pro uh, environmental problem locally. <coughs> but as a marketing campaign, as a branding campaign, there's a lot of power to this imagery that's created by combining physics with computer animation. All right, so that's all the propaganda, and I guess I want to give you a little bit of a sense of what goes on under the hood, what happens in our research lab, and where are we going with this as we look into the future. So how do we compute motion? Well, first of all, to compute motion, we have to think about all of the very same things that the artists in uh, Seven Dwarfs and Snow White had to think about. All of the different <coughs> things like gravity, air, flexibility, obstacles, friction, air resistance, and so forth. And uh, how do we do that? Well, we, we translate all of that physics into equations. And we like to get as much bang for the buck as we can, so we don't like to do more math than we have to. So we look for equations that describe many physical systems. And uh, everyone here knows this equation? No. <laughs> but what's interesting about this equation is that this one equation describes the shape of cables um, at the suspension bridge. It describes the flexibility of little hairs on cells and on your throat and lungs, so atrapia, so cilia. And it describes the spinning motion of a spinning top. So if we can work with equations such as these that cover a lot of ground, then uh, we can have a lot of power in the simulations that we do. So we try to be general in, when we model the world. The other thing uh, that we do uh, well, we take these equations and we just code them up. It's just a little bit of math, right? Um, <coughs> well, there's a hard way and there's the easy way. The hard way is to just kind of blindly grind through all of it. And one of the things that we really focus on in our group is simplicity. Okay, simplicity as a concept is kind of uh, an awkward one to grapple with at first because you say, well, if my idea is so simple, if what I have say so simple, nobody's going to take me seriously. If I, if I write a, a research paper that's really simple, 
and uh, look simple to the reader, well, they're just going to think, this was, this was too simple. Why are we accepting this into some fancy journal? Here's this other paper that I can barely understand. It must be harder. It must be good. right? But that's very short-term thinking. In the long term, an idea that's simple is easier for other people to understand. Therefore, it's easier to get out in the world and get views. It's going to have more impact. right? So sometimes, even just today, we had a grant proposal deadline uh, having to do with origami with two engineers that I'm working with. And you only got five pages to describe your idea. And so these pages were like packed. Every little inch of them was used. Okay? And when I would take my pass over the editing, I was deleting sentences here, there, everywhere, and, create, and changing some paragraphs that were really long paragraphs into short bullet points and just making the page have a lot more white in it, a lot more blank area. And, and I was kind of the senior mentor uh, to, these, to these two other faculty, and they were asking me, well, isn't this a problem? Aren't people going to like think that, well, you only had five pages, and you couldn't even fill up five pages, so that must mean you don't have very much to say? And I said, no, all of the panelists for, the, for, for this have tons and tons of these to review. They're going to be reading them on the train to DC, where they're going to have to remember what they read and try to give a summary and argue for why they like. And if they see five dense pages of information, they're not going to remember what they read. But if they remember that they saw these bullets that clearly stood out, and that sentence that clearly stood out, and a lot of white space around it, they're going to remember the key ideas we want. In other words, if there's a lot of information there, it's, we're at the, the mercy of luck that they remember the parts we really want them to remember. But if we really make stand out those pieces that are important, then we can control that they remember those parts. So simplicity and really knowing what you want to communicate is critical. So in this case, in terms of equations, we make it simple by looking for simple explanations for the underlying phenomena. I like to use this analogy of uh, a snowflake. Snowflake is a really complicated shape, and uh, if you zoom on it, it's fractal-like in nature, meaning that it has more and more detail as you zoom more and more. The question is, could there be a simple explanation for this for this really simple for this really complicated shape? And beautifully, the answer is yes, there is. You start with a triangle, and to each side of this triangle, you glue another triangle. And now you have this little Star of David type shape. And to each side of that, you glue another triangle. Made of this shape. And to each side of that, you glue another triangle. And if you keep doing this over and over and over again, you get a really complex shape with a really simple algorithm or a really simple process. And that complicated shape is the snowflake. So sometimes, Complex phenomena can be explained in simple ways, and that's a good thing. The other thing that we do in our research is we try to focus on the interesting behavior. So when we're writing our computer programs and computer algorithms, we don't try to get every single aspect of the physics perfectly right everywhere. Rather, we think some parts of the physics are more important than others for the problem we care about. And one of the earliest examples of this came from crushing the Coke can in my PhD thesis. And at the same time that I crushed the Coke can, I also inflated an airbag. Here's a simulation of a, of a little pink heart-shaped airbag. And it has some smooth regions and some wrinkled regions. And the idea be behind adaptive algorithms, algorithms that spend the extra computation where it's needed most is to focus on those interesting wrinkles and folds. So my algorithm started with only 50 variables that were spread out everywhere and kept adding variables as the airbag inflated. But it didn't add them everywhere. It added them around the regions of wrinkles and folds. So that by the time it finished, it used about 1,000 variables, which was a lot at the time. It's peanuts now. But 
with those thousand variables, it got the realism that you would have needed with a hundred thousand variables if you spread them out evenly. And that's by putting them around the, the regions that matter the most. So those strategies, which are get a lot of bang from the buck from the mathematical model by choosing a mathematical model that covers lots of ground, look for really simple explanations for the physics so that it's simpler to code and simpler to explain to others, and make the computer efficient by focusing on the interesting behavior, those are the approaches that we use. And where, where does all of this get us? Let me show you a few applications that we've worked on. One of them is that we've worked on computing the motion of fabric. And we did this here in the lab without thinking of a specific customer in mind. But as it turns out, uh, various people got interested in our ability to simulate the motion of fabric. Disney uses it. For example, uh, in Tangled, uh, the heroine, we're not allowed to say princess, the heroine, Rapunzel, uses it. The problem is, you see, and this is off the record, is that they had a lot of problems with the previous two Disney movies that only girls went to see them and not boys because you know they were girly movies. <laughs> so so um, so when they did the first trailers for Tangled, um, they, they they did focus groups and again the boys weren't going to see them and so they they realized that they had to also show the sides of the movie that have action to them and are in some sense more masculine. And they also had to uh, defeminize the movie by changing the princess to a heroine, which arguably also empowers uh, the heroine of the movie. Yeah. All right, listen, I didn't want to have to do this, but believe me, no jokes. The camp is smaller. <laughs> Thank you. 
interesting how life works. Why did they come and talk to us? Well, they actually came to talk to us because one of the guys at Adobe who was in charge of this project used to work at DreamWorks. And when he was at DreamWorks, he worked next to the guy who was working on clothing. And the guy who was working on clothing had been interacting with us about some of the clothing stuff. So it's a kind of a small world. People move around. And one of the things that I've noticed, whether it's with journalists or with opportunities with industry or with collaborators, um, is and, and a friend of mine told me this years ago, and I remembered it. It's really important. It goes like this. And there was a wise man uh, who was extremely lucky. He had been lucky all his life, and he was an old man, and, and he had everything. He had a beautiful wife and kids, and a white house, and a picket fence, and uh, everything. And people just came up to him and said, yeah, uh, uh, old man, how are you so lucky? What, how are you so lucky in your life? And he says, it's not about luck. He said, there's opportunities at every instant flying you by, all right? Um, but you have to know that it's an opportunity. You have to know what you're looking for and grab it while it's there. Otherwise, it's gone. And I've learned that both the good way and the hard way. I've had journalists call us about a paper we've published saying we're interested in it, and for some reason, the email gets stuck in the mailbox for two days, and by the time they respond, they've moved on to something else. And that same article they might have written about the technology might have led to some other nice thing and so forth. Or the other way around, people I've run into at a conference have said, hey, let's sit down and have a coffee. And you might be tempted to say, well, I'm busy. I have lots of things. I don't know anything about who you are. I don't have time for this. But if you actually spot ways, this could be really interesting. It could grow into something amazing. So being in touch with what is it that you want in your life, and where do you want your life moving, and where do you want your research moving, or, or your romantic life moving, or anything else, if you're in touch with that, you'll spot opportunities that otherwise will be completely invisible to you until you see them in hindsight. So, that happened in this case, and we said this is a great synergy between what we've been working on and what you need. And so uh, now Photoshop, since version 5, has realistic paintbrushes. And let me give you a little demo of that. Do 
uh, a head of hair. And here's a little test that what a digital conducted um, just to see will this hair simulation stand up to all the trials and tribulations of an actual movie. And so here's a little obstacle course they put the hair through. <laughs> and here's a little snapshot. And, and today, if you pull up uh, the trailer for The Hobbit, and you look at the hedgehog or all the bunnies or all the animals that you see in the trailer, they're all using Columbia's uh, hair technology or flexible strand technology, which is the same one that's in the Adobe product. So, okay, so this is all fun and, and glamorous, but you can ask, is there life beyond Hollywood? And that's what I started asking about five minutes ago in order to prepare for this talk. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's fun to visit Hollywood. No, but um, I, I, I started saying, you know, are there ways that we can have uh, real impact on the world, all right? And this is something I've actually struggled with since the day that I did not go into political science. I kind of had this view in my mind that if I went into political science, then I really cared about the world, and if I went into engineering, I was just kind of doing it to pleasure myself. And my dad kind of said to me, no, you've always been interested in engineering since you were young. You really should go in here, not just into political science, for the sake of it. And, but it's always, it's never left me, this idea of how can we have a real impact in the world. And, you know, actually from uh, a lot of the uh, inspiring talks I've seen over the past years, including uh, Dean Spendiowski, Penny Amora's talks, and, and previous deans and, and colleagues around me, all of which talk about the good that engineers can do, I no longer have a big guilt trip about this, but it's still there, and I still want to have an impact. And there's an interesting struggle there. When I go to visit the studios, they give me a great sales pitch. Sebastian Silman, the chief technical officer at Weta, says, you know, movies are uh, the repository of the collective imagination of society. So when people imagine things, we see them in the movies. And so by, by making it possible to visualize these things, we spur the imagination of society. And I think that's interesting, and I think there's some truth to that. But for me, I really want to see how I can have an impact in other sectors at the same time. And the basic idea for me is that there's the cycle of innovation. You have an idea, you run some experiment, that experiment <coughs> works or doesn't work, but you get new ideas from it. And from those new ideas, you, uh, you proceed and you, and you innovate. And what's the costly or expensive or dangerous part of this process? It's not sitting at your desk coming up with an idea or, or in the shower, although you could slip. It's, <laughs> it's, it's the experiment usually. It takes time to set up the experiment and to run the experiment and to make sure the experiment works. And if you can replace that by a predictive computation, uh, then you can get a lot of mileage from that. So there's a few examples of that from, from more fun to more serious. Uh, here is a simulation uh, of human clothing where there's a pattern on the left. These are the actual patterns that a tailor would cut out of a flat piece of textile. And on the right is the sewn up uh, draped garment on a person. And what's interesting about this software system that we developed is that it's all running in real time interactively. So as you change the garment pattern, you can instantly see how it looks draped on the human body. Now, how many of you have played with those little pull apart puzzles? You know, two metal pieces, they're locked together, you've got to separate them, show of hands. Okay, now I'm gonna give you, do you have this living here? I don't play. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't believe you. Um, so, so I give you two options here. Uh, one way to solve that puzzle is to think really hard for as long as you want, let's say a, a whole day, and then pick up the puzzle for 10 seconds or 20 seconds, try to separate it, put it down, learn from your mistake, think really hard for another 12 hours, pick it up, play for 10, 12 seconds, put it down, and in between you think a lot. So in other words, you try a little experiment and then you think, or the other option you have is to tinker with it. 
which do you think is going to get this solution faster? Tinkering. Because tinkering builds intuition. And that's the idea behind getting the simulation to run in real time. You can get a lot more feel for how the garment sits on a person and how drawing various starts or cuts or changing the shape of the pattern affects the fit if you can do it all in real time. Now, right now, the way clothing is designed traditionally, somebody sketches what they want the clothing to look like on paper and to be a sketch of me, for example, wearing this fabulous clothing. <laughs> and, then, and then someone else, another expert called the pattern expert, says, OK, I see your sketch, try these patterns. And then a third person actually cuts them out, sews them together, and puts them on a mannequin. So that's the old process, the process that takes a really long time. This sort of technology developed last year can start to change such design processes. It doesn't have to be clothing. It can be any design process in which there's a long term or turnaround time see a prototype. And there is a uh, startup company uh, that has licensed uh, this technology. They're called Thunder Lily. And this summer, one of my postdocs, Danny Kaufman, and one of our master's students, uh, Pei Lan, have been working together with Thunder Lily to get this technology uh, and, and, and make Thunder Lily possible. And what's interesting now is that all of the garments on Thunder Lily's website were designed uh, by using uh, by using this uh, kind of design technology. And this is this company is going in a really interesting direction. They want to make a marketplace where anyone who wants to design clothing can design clothing uh, virtually. All right, via a web interface. And anyone who wants to buy clothing can look at all these virtual designs and pick one. And once they pick a virtual design, uh, then they can um, pick a manufacturer from another column on the website. And that manufacturer can make the design they want, and it can be altered. So you can start to go towards uh, custom <coughs> clothing and more creative uh, individualized clothing. So on the flexible strand side, the project we worked on involved a physicist. His name is Vasile Tovi, and he's in France. And since then, he's become a close friend of mine. But we met at a conference, and this is one of these instances in which you have to spot the opportunity and pursue it. And Basile is interested in knots, because that's what he's interested in. <laughs> and so he was using our software to basically compare the shapes that different types of knots take when they're twisted. And at first, of course, he compared to actual knots until he gained confidence that the software was predictive. But once he gained confidence that the software was predictive, he could start playing along with the software. And how many of you have an iPad or iPod or anything with cables, right? And isn't it annoying when you pull out the cable and it's all tangled? And then you have to spend time untangling it. So I estimate that we can save many, many lifetimes of humanity <laughs> if we could make cables that don't tangle, right? And the first step to that is understanding how knots form, right? So basic science. Again, a flexible strand can be anything, and as Lavinia mentioned, it could also be a surgical needle. And there are these needles that have a beveled tip, it's an angled tip, and so when they get inserted into flesh, they always turn in one direction. And you say, eh, I don't want that in me, but the alternative is much worse. You see, if you had to have a, a radioactive pellet deposited in some organ, um, or near some organ, or if you had to have a biopsy taken, uh, before, with straight hard needles, the way it would work is the doctor would send you to get some images made, and you'd get x-rays or something like that, and they, they would have essentially a map of your body, this x-ray or MRI. And then they would superimpose that on you, tell you not to move, find some angle, and jab you in and out. And hopefully the map was accurate and matched, and hopefully there weren't too many obstacles in the way. So the alternative 
is a little bit better, which is a needle that can steer around sensitive areas, and so you can you can uh, uh, gather the specimen you need or deposit the the, the the substance that you need without damaging delicate organs. And to do this, though, um, it's pretty complicated because how do you steer such a needle? You do it by twisting the end of the needle that's outside the body, right? Because if you twist the needle outside the body, then you're also turning the beveled head inside. So if you turn the beveled head, you turn, you change which way it's going to turn as you keep sticking it inward. So it's it's kind of unintuitive. You have to twist while pushing to steer the needle, and that's really hard to teach doctors. And we could train doctors on you. Or we could train them virtually. And so the idea is to train doctors virtually, or better yet, to make robots that can follow mission plans. <coughs> so the doctor just has to sketch the trajectory, and then the robot does it. But for a robot to do it, the robot needs a mathematical or a physical model for how the system is controlling is behaving. So for all these reasons, you need computer simulation. <coughs> I'm sorry, I hope I don't ruin your dinner. Look away if you must. But here's a more realistic visualization of what this process looks like. So we are at 7.15, and I have quite a bit more material, but maybe it's time to start wrapping up. What, what, what is your take, Lavinia? Do you guys want to have a little longer, and then we can eat? Five minutes, ten it's minutes. It's a democracy. <laughs> <laughs> ten minutes. We'll go for ten minutes and then we'll stop. So one of the ways in which the research in my group has progressed is blindly. <laughs> <laughs> so in other words, we do something that we think is cool, and then some people outside of the uh, Columbia think it's cool, and we work with them to transfer the technology. And then someone else comes along and says, hey, you know what, this is a little bit similar to that. You might want to think of that. And then they say, yeah, right, we were thinking about that all along. And then we <laughs> proceed in that direction. So this is an example of that. Is what happened here is that we had this flexible strand technology. And we were on a roll with getting it used in a bunch of different situations. And then Basile pointed out to us that there are liquids that behave like flexible strands. Here's, here's honey or, or maple syrup. You're dropping it on your waffle. And it makes these nice zigzag patterns or it coils. In other words, it looks like a, a, a piece of string that you've just dropped. And so does that mean that there's you know, some universality to the physics of these things? Can one equation really cover a lot of ground? And we investigated this, and it turns out that it can. And um, not only can it cover you know, maple syrup in your morning uh, breakfast, but it can also cover the kind of folding behavior that happens when lava uh, flows. And this is really fascinating uh, because you know, once lava cools, uh, you don't know how it flows. But you do see some wrinkles. You see some patterns. And from those patterns, if you understand how lava flows, you can simulate how lava flows then you can deduce how hot it was and how fast it was moving at the time before it was frozen. And there's other applications where you care about this. For example, textile production. One third of all textiles produced in the world are not woven. Um, they're not knitted. They are essentially sprayed. These non-woven textiles, here's a zoom up of what they look like. And the way they're made is by taking some liquid polymer, um, putting it inside a vat that's spinning really quickly, putting a few holes on this drum. And so from those holes, this liquid kind of squirts out. And as it squirts out and contacts the air and cools, it hardens and becomes a solid. But it hits against other strings that are coming out of this vat. So it makes a net. And that non-woven textile is what's found in baby diapers, in surgical masks and gowns, in carpets, and in insulation. 
So it's, it's, a, it's a, a multi-billion dollar uh, business. So understanding these string-like flexible things, whether they're liquid or solid, is really important for lots of applications. And here's a little experiment from the University of Toronto uh, in which honey uh, was dropped onto a moving belt. Actually, it's Lyle's golden syrup. And what's fascinating is that the honey is making this, it's not honey, it's Lyle's golden syrup. What's, <laughs> what's funny about this thing is that um, it's making a pattern. And you think, oh, there's somebody up here just moving it back and forth. No. The nozzle is fixed, the belt is moving, and the honey is making this pattern. If you want to kind of reason about why it's happening, well, the honey is flowing at a rate that's faster than the belt is moving, so it kind of has to go somewhere, and so it goes in a zigzag pattern in order to kind of match the speed of the belt. It's kind of like if you want to ride your bike slower downhill, you ride it in a zigzag, so you're not going as fast downhill. It's the same sort of idea. So just by changing the speed at which the belt is moving, you get all of these amazing patterns, and in fact, several others. This is called a viscoelastic sewing machine, or a viscous sewing machine. But I think, uh, since <laughs> Brandon, my husband, is a pastry chef, that it's just a really easy way to decorate cupcakes, because you, you don't have to move your hand anymore, right? You just kind of hold it in place and move the cupcakes below at just the right speed. <laughs> Uh, but but my, my engineering friends say that it has utility for stretchable electronics because if you want to design a stretchable electronic, so uh, electronic on a stretchable material, you want to make sure your wires don't snap. And if the wires are straight and you pull on it, well, they'll snap. So you want to have your wires in a zigzag pattern so they have more give. So you've got to figure out how to deposit the wires in a zigzag pattern. And you can do it either with a really uh, precise robot, or you could do it by understanding this physical system and just depositing the wires at the, the right rate. So a little bit of understanding goes a long way. And so we teamed up with uh, Pedro Rice, my colleague at MIT, for a project called Coiling Spaghetti. And uh, the idea is to understand this phenomenon of of cables falling on substrate at any level. It could be at the level of an ocean liner depositing uh, internet communication cables on the ocean floor, because if it deposits them in a straight line and the earth shifts, then it's gonna snap and you're gonna lose connectivity. And in fact, this happens, especially for islands, they can be without internet connectivity, God forbid, for weeks or months. Can you imagine a month? Who can imagine a month without email or Facebook? <laughs> right. So you want to deposit your internet cables in a zigzag pattern. And you also don't want the ship to go too slow, because if it goes too slow, you'll get one of the other patterns, a loop-de-loop. -loop, and that can just get snagged. Or worse, you can get interference uh, in the communication cable, so you can lose data that way. So you got to deposit it just right. But sometimes, the ocean floor is miles and miles underneath the ship, and so it's hard to see there. It's hard to know how deep the ocean floor is, so you need some mathematical model for how fast the ship should go. And at the other scale, at the nano scale, uh, you want to be able to deposit uh, now microscopic or nanoscopic cables in a zigzag pattern in order to make various types of electronics at really small scale, including stretchable electronics. So we have this uh, kind of partnership going. Uh, Pedro is an experimental physicist, and so he builds essentially desktop scale experiments. They're at, at literally the size of a desk, where he drops his spaghetti and watches the patterns, and we run our simulations, and we communicate back and forth making a lot of progress with these, this kind of problem. So where I see this going is essentially discovering how these technologies, which we have a lot of fun developing in the abstract and then getting out to places like film studios and graphics uh, software and, and other kind of very creative industries, how that same technology 
can start to have a lot of impact in the basic fundamental sciences uh, in, in uh, engineering and in industry at large. So uh, I hope that I've been able to show you today that by computing motion, you can have uh, an effect, hopefully, on everyone and in every sector. And of course, it's not me that it's the stormtrooper and, and, and all of my graduate students. So thank you very much.